Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome to Conversations and to a special conversation with my friend and our frequent guest, Elliot Abrams, on Fidel Castro, who mm. was talking here on Wednesday. He died on what, late Friday night, I guess, early Saturday morning. And there's been a huge amount written about it, some of the best stuff written by you. But so let's talk about Castro's death and your reaction to the your reaction to the reactions to that, and then talk about Castro himself. And well, the the reactions to the deaths, as you know, were were a series of encomia um, from uh, people like the Prime Minister of Canada, very famously, which led to a great deal of derision, right. rightly, of him. Uh, Ban Ki Moon at the UN. I mean, heads of state all over. Uh, John Kerry, uh, to a lesser extent, uh, Barack Obama. And they, you know, it was sort of uh, as if a normal head of state had died, as if a normal president had died, which was very striking because he was a vicious and ruthless and murderous dictator. And all of these people talked about, uh, oh, you know, the, the condolences to the Cuban people who will miss him so much. and everything he achieved, particularly the health and welfare, these are all lies. Right. Um, so what really struck me about it was uh, the degree to which people were unwilling to face up to his true record. Somebody on the right who had done the things he had, who had done a tenth of the things he had right. done, would be viewed as a monster. And Castro, you know, we're going to have there will be posters of Fidel and Che Guevara on dorm room mm -hmm. walls for the next 30, 50 years. Well, that's what's years. striking. It's not just that he was treated as a normal president, but more. I mean, a historic figure. 50, right. Of course, he had been around a long yep. time, so that was yep. legit, I suppose. But um, that is pretty amazing, isn't it? What, what does that show, I mean, uh, uh, about us or about the world? Yeah, the EU president was, was terrible. I saw yes, that. Yes, Juncker. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> one thing it shows is that nobody knows anything. I mean, it's really striking. You know, uh, there is the myth, for example, of... Um, well, he broke a few eggs, you know, but um, the health and welfare of the Cuban people rose so quickly. Um, this is false. I actually did a comparison of Costa Rica, um, which um, did better than Cuba over this period without a day of dictatorship, mm. significantly better than Cuba. Uh, of course, the economy was no good. It's a communist command economy with no private property. Where has that worked? Um, but worse yet, of course, are the human rights uh, abuses, uh, which are amazing. The, <clears throat> the uh, summary executions, uh, the political prisons, um, it, it's an astonishing record. So the first thing I think it shows is that uh, nobody wants to know about it. Uh, and so you get very little of it, except in the Miami Herald, which had a fabulous, um, maybe not so surprising, uh, story. I think the second thing it shows is um, there are no enemies on the left, right? Yeah. I mean, um, you can get away with anything as long as you use this kind of standard lefty talk about um, welfare of the people and you oppose imperialism. And this is, I, I guess, the real story behind Castro's long-term appeal. Uh, the New York Times obituary of him was headlined, uh, Fidel Castro, revolutionary who opposed U.S. Okay, there you are. Right. That's what made him really famous. What did that even mean? It's not as if we wanted to conquer Cuba, you know? So, um, I mean, we, did, we, we sponsored the Bay of Pigs, or hosted, I guess, you, the people who embarked on the Bay of Pigs, which was an attempt by Cubans to take back their country from Castro, but that was about it. We weren't, I mean, we, we had an embargo, but... Uh, and, I mean, and one thing, if you were a ruthless dictator, but you had actually liberated your country from something, yeah. you know, but from, from the U.S., let's say, but from a foreign occupying power. I guess he liberated it from a dictator. He who liberated was, who was from a dictator. was much less dictatorial than he was. Well, you know, just take, for example, the famous, he attacks, 1953, Castro, young Fidel, attacks the Moncada barracks. This is July 26th. That's the origin of the phrase, the July 26th movement. So 100 people go on trial for attacking this military barracks violently with arms. Of the 100, um, 31 are convicted. Hmm. Everybody else is let off. Castro defends himself. Everybody has a lawyer. Castro defends himself because he is a lawyer. He makes a four-hour speech defending himself, which he is allowed to make. Um, he and Raul are sentenced to 15 years of prison, and there's an amnesty a year and a half later. 
That's the horrible dictatorship of Fulgencio yeah. Batista. Castro's was obviously 10 times worse. But again, this is kind of lost in the memory hole because he was anti-imperialist. Obviously, uh, it, it is clear that what he did was to make Cuba a colony of the Soviet Union. And he did his best to get us into a nuclear war. I mean, there is right. considerable record that he actually urged Khrushchev to do uh, an attack on the United States to make sure that Cuba wasn't invaded. So it, it's an amazing record of misery and blood and repression. And the United States is sending someone to the funeral to pay our respects to this brutal dictator. You take the left, just to finish on that point, though, would care more about, he betrayed a, a, a left-wing revolution, which had honorable people in it who were trying to establish some version of social democracy or liberal democracy, right? And, and he ruthlessly betrayed that, and that seems to be totally forgotten, too. He did. I mean, I, I just mentioned Uber Matos. Who's Uber Matos? A commandante in the revolution who rides uh, into Havana with Fidel and Che Guevara and all in a tank. Um, and then he sees there, this guy's a communist, and he starts to say, I want to resign from the junta because uh, I don't like the way it's going. Um, what happens? Kangaroo court, sentenced to 20 years in prison, serves every day. There are no amnesties under Fidel Castro. Armando Valladares, who wrote Against All Hope, the great prison memoir, uh, 22 years. Uh, these, are, these are great stories of heroism. In fact, I would say, if you, if you really look at Castro, 50 years, what's, what has he produced? And, and I think he's done, he did two things that communists often do. One, he produced refugees. Yeah. And if you go to Miami now, why is Miami not a dying southern city? <laughs> you know, hundreds of thousands of Cubans saved Miami. And communism always produces heroes. Um, and we, you know, Sharansky and Sakharov and uh, Havel and Valenza. And Cuba has its heroes too. Um, but the story is one of, of um, amazing brutality, even by... European communist standards, by Russian standards, by East German standards. It's a very vicious and brutal regime. It wasn't enough to put people in prison. You had to do psychological and physical torture. I really do think, um, you know, wh why do we know these things about Russia and places like that? The records come out later, and we may have to wait one year or 10 years or 20 years, but the records will come out. What about that? I'm curious. So going for you were a policymaker on Latin America in the State Department. Uh, you dealt with Castro at that time. We could say a word about that if you want. But also going forward, what would what's the Trump, President Trump calls you up and says, hey, you were Assistant Secretary of State for Latin American Affairs. Why don't you, what, what should we do here? Is there an opportunity in Cuba? Is it just he was already given up power and so it doesn't matter much? Uh, well, going back, I would say one thing that, that um, I did not know in the Reagan administration, we found out in the Bush administration, they had, Cuban intelligence had penetrated the United States government. There are spies in jail now, because we right. did in the end find out. Uh, the, the key figure uh, handling Cuba at the Defense Intelligence Agency was a Cuban spy for years and years. So uh, they were very effective in building an intelligence service that penetrated not only Latin America, but the United States. Going forward, um, the first thing you need to do is, I think, uh, to undo what Barack Obama has done. Because what Barack Obama has done is to give gifts to now Raul Castro in exchange for nothing. I'm not opposed to seeking a deal whereby we say, well, we'll lift this part of the sanctions if you allow internet freedom, and this part of the sanctions if you... There was no deal. This was sort of handed to uh, Raul. Uh, I would not send an ambassador to Cuba. Uh, we have diplomatic relations. I'd send a charge down as we've had for a long time, not somebody with the rank of ambassador. This regime does not deserve gifts. There's likely to be a crackdown now because they're probably nervous about what happens after Fidel dies. But this is a country that, that if we're gonna have uh, four or eight years of Donald Trump, um, we should be thinking about what needs to be done for a transition away from communism. Right. What can we do? How can we help? Uh, one way is to insist on reforms in exchange for anything we give them economically, commercially. Another is broadcasting, which we absolutely need to keep up, if not intensify. And we need to be talking to some of our allies now 
and we have them in a few places in Latin America, real Democrats, about what can be done to push Cuba bilaterally, multilaterally, uh, through the OAS, uh, in the direction of an opening. Is it, it is true that generally communist regimes aren't very, well, dictatorships aren't that good at handling transitions. Sometimes they do, and the North Korea just chugs along or whatever, and I guess in the Middle East, sometimes Syria, but often it goes astray as in Syria. I mean, in some way, the, the, the successor isn't as skilled as the original dictator, and we're out what's Raul, yeah. 85 or something <clears> like that. So, and, and not a charismatic figure. So they could, don't you think it could be a moment where with the right kind of pressure and inducements and cooperation with allies, stuff could change there. It's one of these, it won't change till it changes, right? It's not going to be, right. you may won't see it coming for five years anywhere that we did probably with the Soviet Union or some of these other places, but it can happen somewhat quickly, I suspect. Well, could it? You I, know, don't know. I, I don't know what the situation on the ground is in Cuba in terms of, do the Cuban people know, or do they have access to information? They is have there? enough information to know what this and, and um, the, the question is in large part the army, uh, which Raul has been the head of all these decades. And what will the army do? Obviously, the Castros want a, uh, I th would say obviously, a kind of Chinese model in which you have right. maybe some economic opening. Maybe, because the notion that there has been a great economic opening is, is false. All the tourist money, all the commercial money, this is going to the government and the army. It's not going to the people of Cuba. It's not going to the people who work in those hotels. Um, they want something of an economic opening without any political opening. And that's what we've got to refuse. We've got to make them pay for every dollar with some political change. No more political prisoners, for example. Um, and we've got to get help from other countries uh, in doing that. How about the EU? I'd love to talk to the EU about that instead of their stupid eulogies for Castro, do something to help the people of Cuba. Um, whether they'll be willing to stay in this straitjacket, now that uh, the charismatic figure is gone, or how long they'll be willing, I think, is, um, as you said, unknowable. But it's really hard for me to believe with democracy breaking out all around them. Uh, you know, the next to go is probably Venezuela. Um, which puts even more pressure on Cuba. Indeed, it is already putting pressure on Cuba because they're not getting the bailout from Venezuela. Right. Yeah, no, it just seems like this would be a moment. Um, I mean, what was most distressing, put it this way, what was most distressing from just skimming, you know, the Obama eulogy and the others, there's not a word, literally the word freedom, democracy, liberty, none of them was in the, I believe, President Obama's statement. No sense that at this moment we really, uh, uh, you know, we assert our hope that the Cuban people can move towards freedoms and towards democracy. You can leave it vague. You don't have to commit to U.S., obviously, engagement or involvement in making that happen necessarily. But at least the wish, I mean, that, that I thought was struck by how there wasn't even yep. the notional I, the notion, the idea that, you know, yes, we would prefer it to become a free, free country and a democracy. And it's perfectly reasonable for Cuba that we're not talking about a, there's some troubles in the Middle East. Maybe it's a little harder of a lift in some of these countries that have no tradition. But the Cuban people, really, I mean, Puerto Rico and Costa Rica and all right. these other places could be democracies, more or less, most of them, most of the time, in Central American countries even. Mm -hmm. And Cuba can't be? That seems ridiculous. I mean, some of the U.S. And they have all these relatives in the U.S. who know about democracy, right? So it's right. not as if well, they're, that's they're a, not aware. A huge of it. diaspora. Right. Uh, so they certainly do know about it. Some of the tweets or eulogies use, actually use the word freedom, that he fought for freedom, which I suppose means because he sent 25,000 troops to Angola. Right. Um, but, uh, I mean, the general international reaction is pathetic and disgraceful. Um, and I will say, the only thing you can say about Obama that's positive is Kerry was even worse, right. uh, unsurprisingly. Um, we're lucky in the sense that he dies just as we have a transition in the United States, so that a new administration uh, will obviously take a look at um, the new Cuba, what's going to change, can anything change? Uh, and I really hope we take advantage of this. It'll depend on the president, secretary of state, assistant secretary for Latin America. Um, but this is a moment of opportunity for us. I mean, I'm a little hard, Donald Trump was not from, if I can say my wing, maybe our wing of the, party in the conservative movement that would be more interested in talking about and promoting liberty and democracy, then there'd be differences about how to do it, of course, but Trump seemed somewhat uninterested, I think it's fair to say, in that in the campaign and friendly to Putin and so forth, but um, 
I was struck by his eulogy. I think you wrote about this somewhere, right? That it was his eulogy was not uh, was pretty good from Trump. Yeah, Trump's was more like Bush. I mean, for all the you know, yep. Trump's nothing like Bush. No nation yep. building, no democracy promotion. But he actually spoke about freedom yep. and democracy and made it seem like that would be something he would <clears> like <throat> to see happen yep. in Cuba. Whether he's going to have an actual strategy and you know my, the kind you're talking about is another question. But my hope is that he would. Uh, having talked about all these bad trade deals in which we're suckers, that he would have that view of Obama's policy toward Cuba, oh, good, yeah. in which there was no balance, in which there was nothing given to us for what we gave them, and would would um, would say, well, this is it's got to be renegotiated or stopped. Yeah, it would be interesting if Trump, if Cuba became a moment where a President Trump, President Elect Trump, and President Trump rethinks a little bit his. Uh, apparent indifference to this, this what Bush called the freedom agenda and realizes you don't have to intervene in some places you can differ on Iraq but you know Cuba a place that we have an awful lot of leverage on and and allies nearby as you say who presumably would like to see it move in the right direction a tottering old regime we're not talking about a you know young Islamists who you know, how much however bad they are have real f can make your life miserable if you try to help make the country yeah. democratic who, who in Cuba would object and apart from the army obviously in the communist to the top tier, tier of the communists. Is there any evidence that any actual normal Cuban wouldn't be perfectly happy to live in a free and freer and free market oriented no. society? I mean, <clears throat> uh, no. Um, so I hope you know. I hope that changes. I would also like to see uh, Trump reel back in some of the specific tourism related changes. Mm -hmm. I think it's a disgrace that you have all these American tourists under these fake guises of, well, which is an educational tour, you know, going down to the beach. To the extent that they're not on the beach, they're actually led around by the Cuban regime to meet their artists, their uh, writers. Um, all the money goes to the regime. How can people do this? I would like to ask people, you know, would you have gone to the beach while Nelson Mandela was in prison in South Africa without thinking twice about it? Um, well, the answer is yes, they probably would. Right. So it's up to the government. It's up to the government to say, we're not subsidizing this regime. Pull it back, and then you can negotiate with the regime. Is that pretty doable? I mean, it's not, it's not yeah. it doesn't require Every, Congress. Well, this is, no. Congress didn't act in the first place, right? Precisely. Everything that Barack Obama did, he did uh, by executive order. Is that right? So the entire Cuba There was no change in, absolutely no change in the Cuba embargo. Congress has done nothing. So uh, you could just do it. Uh, as they say, with the stroke of a pen. And are there big business interests who would object? A few, but not. You know, uh, what's this? You got 10 million people in Cuba, 10 million poor people. Uh, so it isn't exactly China, you know, where. Right. Um, yeah, if you ran a cruise line or if right. you had a hotel. Oh, uh, well, that's an <laughs> opportunity for any, Trump. He, he doesn't, doesn't have it. Right. Any. I think he needs to think about <laughs> that. You know, in free Cuba, there would be a Trump Tower or that's a Trump <laughs> hotel, you know. Um, <laughs> No, so there are not, there are agricultural interests. There are some governors who've gone down there, but you know, the, we're, we're talking about uh, orders from Cuba for a million dollars or $2 million. Um, this is not China where you can understand the amounts are uh, fantastic, the population is huge. Um, so again, I would, uh, this is a real opportunity and in a way the timing is good. And how poor is Cuba? I mean, it's, it has not done very well under Castro, obviously. So, I mean, surely they must have a sense that, I don't know if they still have a decent level of education and literacy. Yeah, and stuff I mean, the so, literacy... I mean, literacy, this literacy, is a country that, what, 50 years ago, one would have said, Q, I, th I have the impression that pre-Castro Cuba was a pretty well-off place for that part of the world. No, it's true. Uh, when Castro came in, literacy was about 85%. It's now, you know, 97, yeah, 98. So. But that's true, of course, of so much of the world, including so much of Latin America now. Um, it's a it's a very poor country. Um, life expectancy, if you compare again Costa Rica and Cuba, um, higher in Costa Rica. Part Cuba has more suicides. Cuba has uh, more abortions. By the way, many 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 more. Um, the uh, uh, gross national income per capita is about six thousand dollars. I think it's a little bit lower than that which puts it in kind of lower middle rank globally. I mean, comparison, Costa Rica is 10,000. Um, so it's not a rich country. It's not, you know, it's not Haiti, but it is right. not a rich country, and it's a small country. Um, you know, under Castro, one of the 
really remarkable achievements was that they had in 2007 the lowest sugar harvest in 100 years. They were importing sugar. Wow. Um, you could begin to rebuild the economy. And look, tourism in a free economy, tourism would be, in fact, a very big part of it. That's you what know, I was thinking. You could have, I mean, there would be inducements. It wouldn't be that hard if you could get the, the, the sense going that there's real advantages here. We're not, right. Freedom's great on its own, but also there's real prosperity here. And you, know, you can imagine Cuba. And if you had a free economy, you've got a million, well, more now, a couple of million Cubans in the diaspora, perhaps two or three million, Spain, uh, United States above all, of course, um, there's your investor class. Right. Uh, but that requires having a free economy. But that you could have, since they do want that investment, that's where the leverage comes. So you yes, really, the key is leverage. to make it, is to linkage, as we used to say. And yep. Didn't we used to say that 40 years ago? I can't remember anymore. Yeah, I think yeah. you, you worked on that. Maybe your uh, first job was Scoop Jackson or something, weren't we? Yes. For, weren't we the, for linkage with the, uh, with the Soviet, Soviet Union? Soviet Union, and, and to put it in uh, more Trump-like terms, a bargain for exchange. We shouldn't be suckers here. Good. Okay. Well, President Trump will watch this this weekend, President-elect Trump, and get you on the phone and we'll, it will it'll be great. It would be fantastic. I've got, I, I, I mean, I grew up never remembering anything but Castro, you two really, I suppose. I mean, and um, it just would be great to, I mean, right here, it's a, a terrible. I mean, Russia's got problems, but it's not the Soviet Union, East Europe, Central Europe, mostly, almost all free countries, some of them having some issues. Asia, of course, huge progress in our yep. day, South Korea, Taiwan, and so forth. It's just so, and Latin America, huge progress. Uh, much, so much of it when you were in the government working on these issues. And now to have Cuba right off our coast is this backward, cruel dictatorship. It's really terrible. It's, it seems uh, like it would be a great thing for Trump to really realize yeah. that it would be a, a kind of a, an achievement, just a, a, not an impossible one. Again, we're not and, talking about transforming the Middle East or something. Right. You know? No, no. And, and by the way, this is still a dangerous dictatorship, dangerous to the United States in the sense that. It is capable, for example, of launching a refugee crisis um, anytime it wants to. So um, there, there are dangers here, and, and there are huge opportunities. You know, in the sense that nothing would more affect the Middle East, and in fact, I think I'd say uh, Islamic extremism than a revolution in Iran that would end the Islamic Republic. Uh, no change in Latin America would really be more hmm. significant than... Cuba becoming a democracy. It, it should be on the agenda for the Trump administration because, as you were just saying, it's not an impossible dream. It is something that can be achieved. Good. On that note, let's hope that it gets achieved and that President Trump and others in Congress, et cetera, listen to this, uh, to your wise words. Thank you, Elliot, for joining me today. You're welcome. And thank you for joining us on Conversations.